Welcome. Uh, we are so pleased to have you here at this session. It's going to be a very interesting uh, discussion about Bluetooth. But before we get to that, and before we get to our speaker, I wanted to give you some very important announcements. Please do not forget to visit the Expo Hall. We have sponsors with contests and swag, community organizations, and you uh, things that you really want to find out about including Red Team Villages with Red Team Talks going on. And there are raffles happening throughout the event, but the only way you can win a raffle is to stop by. So you definitely want to do that. Also, I would like to thank our fabulous sponsors seen here. Uh, we appreciate very much our sponsorship with our sponsors. that allows us to put on this fabulous presentation and allow a lot of people to attend the event. Um, I will be collecting questions from the stage area. And then, um, so as you think of questions, go ahead, type, 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 type away. And then at the end of the presentation, we will go through all of the questions or as many as we can, as many as we have time for. So please join me in welcoming Ria Baldivia, who is a tinker at heart and enjoys merging art with technology. She pursues her curiosity in both domains of history and technology and contributions to various discourses under these topics. She will share her love for Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE, in today's presentation in hopes it will inspire you to tinker. So take it away, Ria. Thank you so much, Dave. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to see you, and I'm pretty excited about today. First and foremost, um, I would like to thank the team and volunteers and the entire staff of the Diana Initiative for hosting this and persevering despite 2020. Um, I also am very happy that they did that. It's a testament to the commitment of inclusivity and just, you know, making sure we move forward. And Dave, thank you again for working with me throughout this entire week. Uh, Burgundy also is helping things out and making sure we were all on board. Um, so today, um, I'm Maria Baldivia. I'm, I'm going to talk about bluesy clues. What clues can I share with you um, to help you on your journey um, playing with Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, and just these little devices that you pretty much buy at the store. Um, and so let's go ahead and start this fun. So, I mean, Bluetooth is everywhere. You have your mobile device. Enable Bluetooth there. You have your smart refrigerator, your smart bulb, and then you have a network in your own home that you're building unknowingly. You pretty much buy all these things and you coordinate and automate what turns on, what turns off, what color, brightness, and all that wonderful stuff. And then you have Bluetooth um, that's enabled even in vehicles and other items. And pretty soon the Bluetooth Special Interest Group is going to have um, audio low energy, and I'm pretty excited about that because I love playing with music programming. That was my introduction to STEM was with music. How do you program music? So um, here we are today playing with Blue Z and they are going to and we're going to basically talk about, you know, what exactly you can do at home, open source items, hardware that you can get on the cheap. And um, actually you may not need to buy a hardware item if you have an Android mobile. So let's go ahead to our next slide. Um, I'm a historian, as I mentioned, uh, I do history and technology, and I, I like merging both worlds. And um, when I talked about, you know, my interest in Bluetooth with friends, they were like, well, where did that name come from? And I was like, I don't know. So let's go ahead and look it up. And lo and behold, the engineer that was responsible for Bluetooth um, is a history buff as well. And he was inspired by a book about biking. And um, the logo actually is a bind room. So it's named after the Viking King during the 10th century. Um, king Harold Blotland Formson, um, he united Scandinavia. Jim Carter came up with a name in 1997. He was inspired by a book he was reading about the Vikings. Viking. Um, basically, the symbol represents the king's name, um, also known as Bluetooth, his initial. And um, he also was inspired, the engineer was inspired by Franz Benjamin's longship book. It focused on Danish warriors and who had a, a thing for adventure. And then there was a Vikings book that exposed them to the runic stone. And what I find really fascinating is not only is he a history buff, but he, he was inspired by the concept of King Formson um, 
when he unified Scandinavia. So he saw the product that he was building as something that would unify, you know, multiple devices and things into like some sort of mesh network. And so that's how Bluetooth came about with um, with um, with this product. And I thought that was really cool. And I, I wanted to make sure that you, um, I shared it with you. If this is the only thing that you walk away with after this talk, that's perfectly fine. But yeah, um, Bluetooth is named after a 10th century team from who is responsible for United Scandinavia. All right, so let's start high level here. We have Bluetooth, wireless technology um, specification is developed, managed, and maintained, published by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. Um, they also do that with Blue Z. Um, within Bluetooth, you have the low energy on the 2.4 gigahertz bubble, and then it used to be called Blue Smooth. Um, Bluetooth Smart, and in contrast to um, classic Bluetooth, um, it's designed to provide significantly lower power consum consumption. So these allows apps to communicate with PLE devices, you have peripheries, peripherals that you can engage with, connect with, interact with. So um, that's that's a, that's pretty exciting. And these things are just getting much more sophisticated and fun. And um, the more you know about them more fun you can have with them even at home if you just want to research what exactly do you have at home. All right, so after Bluetooth Low Energy, let's get down to the Linux Bluetooth Protocol stack, which we call BlueZ. Um, it's an open source project under the general public license. So it was developed um, in 2001 and released in 2001, and then in 2004, it was handed over to Marcel Holtman. And then, just like Bluetooth, um, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, they um, man gained maintenance uh, responsibilities, maintainership, um, in 2005. So the components, when you play with Blue Z or Bluetooth Low Energy, such as the unique identifiers and all of that stuff, the attributes, the characteristics, those still play um, with the specifications that were published by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. And here you have you no know, Tuck. You can't forget him uh, since we're playing with Linux. Got to put a heart there. All right. Some background information on the features. Um, BlueZ provides support for the four Bluetooth layers and protocols available on BlueZ.org. One of the things that I um, want to highlight here is that it can support um, multiple Bluetooth devices. Um, let's say you have a Raspberry Pi or a single um, processing board that has Bluetooth 4.1 in it already, if you get a Bluetooth USB or a two or three and use one of the tools, such as the, um, the, the HCI tool, you can actually still stand up all those Bluetooth devices. They'll have their um, Bluetooth device address as well. And then they can actually start scanning for periphery. So I think that's really cool. Um, now we're just gonna play, for this presentation, we're just gonna play with one Bluetooth device that's going to serve as um, as the, the main um, broadcaster tool. Then, then we'll scan and look for periphery. Um, Bluezy consists of many separate modules. Um, we have things that deal with the um, control interface. We have things that deal with protocol decoding and analysis tools. And the three main items that we're actually going to play with are introduced with, but we're going to play with two main items are um, basically Bluetooth control. Bluetooth PTL, um, HCI config, HCI tool, and then there is the gen generic attribute um, tool called GAT tool. So platforms and distributions, um, Z kernel modules, things that basically um, you have libraries, utilities, anything that, that you can get your hands on. I mean, I'm, I'm using the Raspberry Pi for this presentation. Um, distributions, anything that's Debian-based, I mean, for Linux, it's Blue Z. Um, one of the things that didn't show up when I took this from bluezy.org is that it also is utilized, you can use it in Kali Linux. I had some issues when I was playing with my Raspbian Buster version uh, for, um, for this, and I was like, well, let me try my Kali Linux on my Pi and see if that can work. And it turned out, okay, it was great because I needed to use Wireshark anyways, a packet analyzer, uh, and we're going to go through that too. So, here we go, we have commands. Commands that we're gonna utilize or get exposed to. 
Bluetooth control command line interface to Bluetooth. You have the HDI device configuration utility where you will tell the Bluetooth device that you're on to stand up or to shut down. Um, and then you will utilize the HDI tool for a low energy scan. Um, basically, once you stand up your Bluetooth device, pull up the HDI tool. I want you to scan for all the peripherals out there that are utilizing low energy. And then I added GAT tool here. What's interesting about GAT tool is the most recent um, flash up to date version of um, Blue Z. Doesn't download or install GAT tool by default. You have to do that um, um, individually, modularly, and um, that's available online as well. But not too bad. Either way, you can still utilize GAT tool. All right, so with applications, um, before we get into these Blue Z tool sets, I think it's important to understand why these tool sets are what they are. Um, it's because of these characteristics and the layers that are involved in low energy. So with the generic access profile, you have the application layer and then you have the host layer. And then within that, you have the generic access profile, which dictates how devices interact with each other. I mean, you have the role, you have the broadcaster, you have the um, observer, you have the central, you have the peripheral. And then you go in ahead and have a generic action profile, which is called GAP. It establishes how to exchange all profile and user data over a low energy connection. Um, and then you have the um, security manager protocol and the attribute protocol um, here. The attribute protocol is very special. That's where the data gets exchanged. And um, you know, the logical link control and adaption protocol, the L2 cap layer is um, the routing mechanism for the action protocol and security management protocol. So when you do some analysis on packets, one of the things you need to do is to make sure that you're looking at packets that, um, that contain the action protocol. Um, and then you have the host controller interface, which basically, um, you know, it's the interface between the host and the controller. And then you have the link layer and the physical layer. The physical layer, um, it contains the analog communication needs this thing is on 2.4 hertz. And then um, you have the link layer, you have the defined the device sending advertising packet, a device that initiates the connection and manages it layer, and then a periphery device and advertiser. Um, so basically, that's responsible. They're responsible for the rules there. Um, so now that we have some sort of glimpse of what exactly the low energy protocol stack is, Let's go ahead and play with the um, H, the host control interface um, tool here, um, HCI config. So we're gonna deal with HCI and general attributes. So you go ahead and let's say you have your Raspberry Pi and it has Bluetooth in it, the Raspberry Pi 3, Raspberry Pi 4, those, those versions come with the um, um, Bluetooth 4.1. If you have anything under like Raspberry Pi 2, you may have to get a Bluetooth USB. So let's go ahead and do sudo HCI config number and then your command. So in this case, I have sudo hdi config hdi zero, my first device, I want you to basically stand up. Um, run that command, go ahead and enter hdi config again, and then your output is the device saying, yeah, this is my type of, um, this is what I am, this is my address, um, and I'm up and running. So what do you do next? So in addition to the up command, you can tell um, them to basically shut down, reset, our stack, off, no off, encrypt, and non-encrypt. We're not gonna use all of these commands here. Um, what we're actually gonna um, walk through is up and down, and then we're not even gonna do reset, but at home, I, I use those three. I, I haven't done our stack, off, no off, encrypt, and non-encrypt yet with the HDI config and the HDI tool at all. So. Go ahead and scan it up. Um, it's basically saying that it's down. I want to scan it up. You run that command again, and you have your HCI um, zero up, and it says, yep, I'm up and running. Fantastic. Now that my Bluetooth device is up and running, I want it to scan the room for devices that um, basically are low energy. So here I'm going to use the HCI tool do HCI tool and then dash I, which basically says, hey, I want you to interact with things. Um, I want I want the, the, the first device to go ahead and scan the room. So when I do that, low energy scan, the output will showcase devices um, 
and I and I should be able to see my device. I mean, there are a bunch of other devices, but I blacked them out. So what I wanted to show you, is, yeah, they picked up my device, um, a light bulb, and it provided this address. It looks like a Mac address, but it's a Bluetooth address. And I'm like, all right, good. So let's go ahead and see if I can interact. So it's important, though, to note that HDI tool has been deprecated upstream. And if you currently just use HDI tool command without sudo, then you'll be picking up Bluetooth Classic. So make sure to include sudo in order to pick up low energy packets. Um, and make sure that it works with low energy 4.1 controller. All right, so now that I have the device badges, I can connect using the LECC, the low energy PC um, under HDI tool. Um, that's one way to connect. There's another way to connect under Blue D, which is a blue control. Um, a Bluetooth control is a command line interface to Blue D. Um, basically, do a pseudo Bluetooth control. I want you to connect to this address. And then if things are OK and can connect, it gets connected, and it tells you connection is successful. One thing about low energy um, is that it can't do multiple connections at once. So if I have my phone out, on my scanner on my app connected to um, to my light bulb. I need to make sure that I disconnect before I try to get my Bluetooth control to um, connect between my first device and my second device. So make sure you disconnect and it's only one connection at a time. All right, so now what about um, generic attributes? We have the client and we have the server. So the GAT client corresponds to the eight um, attribute client. Um, it does not know anything in advance about the service attributes, so it must first inquire. Communication needs to happen, a connection needs to happen, and basically I need you to reveal what exactly is going on with you. So it must first inquire about the presence and nature of those attributes by performing service discovery. So what are the primary services that I can um, play with, or if I can't play with it, what can you see, what can you reveal, what are your characteristics? After completing service discovery, it can then start reading and writing, if permission are there for you to write and read um, um, found in the server as well as receiving server initiated updates. And then on the server side, you have the GAT server again corresponding with the app server. Um, it receives requests from a client and sends responses back. It also sends server initiated updates when configured to do so. So every low energy device sold must include at least a basic GAT server that can respond to client requests, even if only to return an error response. And I'm actually going to show you that on a screen capture I got for on my app when I wanted to scan and connect with my Bluetooth um, light bulb, my smart light bulb. Okay. So generic attributes um, establishes in detail how the change of all profile and user data um, over a BLE connection. It deals only with actual data, transfer procedures, and formats. It attribute protocol again whenever you do your packet analysis make sure you're filtered down to your app protocol so that you can actually see the data or actually um capture the right request the right commands and actually get a glimpse and gleam of the data exchange so here's a little um table to showcase how these things are next within each other so the GAT server it has services within services there are characteristics like what exactly do this this value do what color of the light bulb do you want this to be? Do you want this to be dimmer? Do you want this to shut off? Do you want this to be bright or not? And basically in that is what are the descriptors? Descriptors and values and all those other attributes. So you have the descriptor at the small level, the micro level, and that fits into the characteristic. Um, think of it as a container, container of user data and metadata. And then you have that within the service, and then when the service, you have that in the GAT server. Um, this, again, is taken from the O'Reilly um, book. Um, the um, intro to um, Bluetooth Low Energy, which is a great primer. Um, it's not pink and purple in the book. I just made sure everything was pink and purple for this presentation to get the logo, plus it's a beautiful color, color scheme. All right, so now that we have a basic understanding of what the generic um, attributes are and the importance of attributes when it comes to analyzing the data that's a, um, that is being shared between my app and a smart device, Let's go ahead and take a look at the Blue Z tool that I, um, I thought when I wrote about this proposal and this presentation. So we have the GAT tool. So the GAT tool is a way to discover, read, and write characteristics with um, the tool onto basically the, um, the characteristics and the values and the attributes. It defines the data structure for organizing characteristics and attributes 
and it wants and you can launch sexual and interactive mode basically sexual venti and then you basically have all these commands once you establish the connection with the address you can say i want you to reveal your primary services i want you to reveal these characteristics they need known characteristics that match um specification to the big the um special interest group but if the manufacturer creates a new requirement or capability that isn't quite defined by Bluetooth as IG, then these um, characteristics can include customized um, identification. They're called unique universal um, identification numbers. All right, so what can you do with that tool? I want to know my primary, reveal your characteristics. I want you to read the characteristics. I want you to, I want you to write to the characteristics. I want to do a write request on the characteristics. I want descriptors of the characteristics. And then we can listen and then we can interact. All right, so here I go ahead and go back to my, my initial setup where I have a pseudo GAT tool set in interactive mode. I go ahead and see that it's working and I tell the um I tell them to say, hey, I want you to connect to this address because I want to learn more about it. So I go ahead and tell it, connect to the address, and if it's feasible, it it it's attempting to connect. And then I successfully connect. Once that happens, I, I want to say, I want to say what, what's the primary service directory? So all I do is type primary service. And then throughout the characteristic commands, you're going to see this attribute, um, and then you're going to see the UID. And these are supposed to basically match up against some sort of specification, some sort of action. If it's been um, approved and normalized by the um, special interest group, then it's going to have a, a a standard, a standard number. If not, and it's unique to the manufacturer, then it's going to have a customized um, new ID. All right, so I want to do characteristics, which is much more robust than primary. Um, I have handles that look like they are standard specification from the special interest group. And then further down, it looks like there are an incremental trend that doesn't look like it's specified by the special interest group. I mean, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, 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 1911, and then the next one is 1912, and then 1913, 1914. And that, that should tell somebody, like, oh, that looks like it's customized, it's been generated, um, and it doesn't basically, it's not specified, um, it doesn't fulfill a specification of, of the special interest group. All right, so I bring this up because um, you have several ways to go about this. I approach this by using an app called the NRF Connect. You can download it on your phone. And again, it scans, and then I found my device, and I connected with my device, and then it shows me the client, um, client GAT and the um, server GAT and all these characteristics, um, both the specified fact, um, characteristics that match with the special interest group, and then it shows me the unknown characteristics. That tells me, like, oh, that must be customized. That must be, like, what the manufacturer created. And they're not telling me what it is. They're not going to tell me what it can do. But it has a UID and it has um, the permissions defined. Some of these are write, some of these are um, read, some of these are notify, and, and some of these are write but no response. So I'm like, okay, that looks interesting. So you can also do that with that tool where you type the primary and the characteristics like I did in my previous um, slide on your terminal. But I think the interface is much nicer and pleasant on my app here. Okay. So when we talk about the universal unique identifier, uh, a universal unique identifier is a 128-bit number that should be unique. Um, I say unique probably is unique, but it should be. Um, and there are two formats, the 16-bit and the 32-bit. Um, earlier, I talked about how you know you have the specified um, numbers and characteristics defined by the special interest group, which is special interest group, and then you have you know, the company is having carte blanche um, in creating a unique identifier because they're creating some sort of like um, capability or requirement that can't be matched or doesn't exist um, within this Bluetooth special interest group. So if you are basically utilizing something that has been specified, you are allowed to use a shorter version with 16 bit. If you are customizing some sort of requirement or capability and there isn't, um, a UID that's utilized from the special interest group, 
then you would have to use a 32 bit and that would have to be exposed whenever somebody does a um, character stick discovery. So, here again to note if a company or developer creates a new requirement or capability that does not fit with any of the standard UIDs, then a custom UID can be generated. And that is actually available um, on that, that generator tool is available on the SIG website. So, all you Bluetooth developers out there, if you have a new capability or requirement, you can customize your UID. So here, standard, I have my table divided into two. You have the client, and then you have the server. Something that's standard and specified, you can take a look at the hat kit 2826, 2829, 2824. For the server, 1803. For link loss, or heart rate, it's 1800. Now, if you have a separate device, and you are actually having these characteristics, you would use the same UID. Now, if you take a look at the customize, at the client side, it's basically my manufacturer creating some new requirements, and there's that custom UID where it's 00102, 34, et cetera, et cetera, 1911. And then if you recall in the screen capture, it actually has three or four um, other characteristics that went to 12, 13, and 14 at the end. So these things are very important because one of the things you need to do is in order to um, interact or engage with a low energy device that permit somebody to read and write um, onto their service, you will need their ID, you will need to understand how does the handle play into this, and then you're gonna need to understand how the value is attached to the handle and how the handle is linked to the identifier. All right, attributes, you have type, permission, value, and handle. And then if you put this on the table, um, basically, you have a hex of zero one, it's identifier, um, you need to identifier one, and the permission is read only zero security. These will actually show up on a packet analyzer. So just keep these in mind, and um, it helps that they're in the table. This is a fix that is set up hex and um, identifier. identifier. All right, so the objective here, let's go do a quick walkthrough. You want to start playing with your Bluetooth low energy devices at home. Who doesn't? I mean, you can buy stuff everywhere, and you have your mobile device. And why not, right? So my environment that I'm going to walk through is I have my Bluetooth um, smart light bulb, I have my mobile app, I have a sniffer, I have Wireshark, and I'm using my Raspberry Pi. I use both the Sally Linux and a Raspbian operating system, the Buster version. So my light bulb is on, and I have my app. I have my app, and it's communicating. I want to change colors. Um, so basically, that's what I'm doing. But I also have my NRF Connect app. I find out what my address is. I go ahead and say, well, I want to learn more. I want to go ahead and dig deeper beneath the, um, the hood. Basically, what is this UID? What is this unknown characteristic? So I'm going to go ahead and get a Bluetooth sniffer. Um, you can do a lot. I use the Bluetooth one here. If you have an Android mobile device, you can do that as well. Um, just enable the um, sniffer in the developer tool option. Um, Adafruit, Blue Fruit, Ellie Sniffer, there are two boards, the blue one and the black one. The black one is actually version one, the blue one is version two. And then you have Microbit. If you want to play with the LE Jack out in Cali, it's all known as the Army Nitro Bluetooth. Leverage the Microbit. Um, you have a Bluetooth adapter um, on it and you can utilize that. Or Ubertooth One, which is um, a bit more expensive than Adafruit, but not too expensive. There are high end ones that are in the thousands. I don't recommend that. You can just get one of these available online. Go to Adafruit. All right, so once I sniff, I go ahead and feed my packet to the um, water chart. And then here I have my um, Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. The reason I use that is because it's Debian based and I need Linux and it's easy to use and accessible. I go ahead and light my light bulb, feed information, connect via my NRF connect, get the information I want. And notice that there are a bunch of unknown characteristics. And I know the permissions, most of them I can write to it, but I don't know anything else. I go in and get my sniffer. I get my Uber Choose one, install it, and I want to make sure it's working because sometimes it doesn't work and you see nothing here. So I go ahead and pull up an Uber Inspection Analyzer and I'm like, oh my gosh, it works. Fantastic. You want to make sure that it's pulling up things that are the two or four gigahertz. You need the white lines, you need the fine white lights or white white lines. But you want to make sure things are start pulling up at the 2.4. All right, so let's go ahead. I feed my data on to my, um, I get sniffed and then it gets into my terminal. I really don't want to do that because it's hard to analyze. I may miss packets. 
I encountered problems earlier and it got really frustrating because it said something was wrong with the file and I need to stop because I reached my limit. And there is a way to get it fed directly into um, Wireshark. Lesson learned here, the most up-to-date recent Wireshark um, is a bit finicky. It also has the opportunity for you to customize the capture feature and sometimes it doesn't work and it's inconsistent using the TMP as a pipe. But I found things that worked with a pipe um, was you know, calling it shark fin. So if you want to learn more about naming pipes, go to FICO on Linux, there's the website. If you want to know FICO on pipes in Wireshark, that's the website as well. As well. But I found these commands that help and make everything work perfectly fine. So you go ahead, um, make your FICO, attempt sharp, um, shark fin, you call on Wireshark, you tell the Uber to, hey, I want you to start um, sniffing LE, and I want you to I'll go ahead and send it directly to Wireshark. And voila, this is what I get. I get protocols that are low energy. I get protocols that are was what I want, the, the attribute, the um, attribute here. But I want to filter it because I don't want to be inundated with so much things I don't need, so much noise. So I go ahead and filter it down to the DCL app um, um, here. And if you recall earlier the presentation, the reason why it's L2 tap is because that's actually transport the, um, the routing um, mechanism for the app protocol that actually hosts the data that the data gets exchanged. So now that I filtered it and I get the protocol that I want, I'm like, all right, let's go ahead and look for write request. I go ahead and do that, and I get my information here. I get information about the Bluetooth low energy link layer. I get information about the Bluetooth LTCAP protocol. And the one I want to deal with and expand is a Bluetooth attribute protocol because that is where I am going to get the service unique identifier information. That is where I'm going to get the characteristic DUID. And that's also where I'm going to get the value that contains the action um, that I want to edit. All right, so now that I have that information, what exactly do I want to do? I am going to basically utilize the blue Z tool, um, such as Bluetooth control, you can do that, or GAT tool, um, or GAT tool. So with the Blue Z tool, I have here, um, call it up, connect to my Bluetooth peripheral, tell it to connect, it's success, fantastic. I want to go ahead and select an attribute, name the attribute, and then I want you to read or write. You have to have permission to do that though. And then if I want to use GAT tool, in order to do those edits, I call on GAT tool, set an interactive mode, go ahead and connect to the address, and once it tells the connection is successful, I go ahead and tell them, say, hey, I want to do a character right request handle, basically the hex that um, contains the action I want to deal with, and then the value. So I want you to go ahead and do a right request to this handle, let's say 0012, and I want you to change it to the color you shot. So, if you are excited about it, as I am, obviously, I'm still very, very excited about it. Um, here are some sources for you to get started. So, you've got Blues, you've got GAT tools, you've got API tools, you've got Blue Control. All of these are discussed um, as a primer and a foundation in getting started with Bluetooth Low Energy Tools, Techniques Export Low Power Networking by Kevin Townsend, um, Carlos Pussy, and Stephen Robert Davidson. And then you have the IoT Hackers Handbook. A Practical Guide to Hacking the Internet of Things by Aditya Gupta. And then Adafruit, there are a bunch of learn tutorials there that can help you work with either the Fruit LE Sniffer or even with Uber Tooth One. And then you have the Blue Z Dot website itself and um, a bunch of other tutorials online. But um, I'm really excited about sharing my love, with my love for Bluetooth Low Energy with you. And I hope this has inspired you to to get involved and just start tinkering and playing with all the devices that you have at home already. So Dave, um, I'm ready to take any questions. All right. Um, thank you so much. This has been really fabulous. Um, how long, um, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been sort of in this discovery process? Oh my gosh, it's been about um, trial and error. It's been over a year. Um, so I started last year and I was like, well, okay, what else can I do? I started finding the hardware, I started exploring at Adafruit. But then I also found that the thing that took the most time was how to know which version 
know which version to utilize and what has been deprecated and if it's been deprecated, can I still use it? So still learning to get comfortable with the um, with all the actual hex values and all of that and with PDU and all that, um, you know, what exactly is the structure with the bits and the headers and then the payload. But um, other than that, it's been a, a one year journey so far, just trying to work, set up my environment, get comfortable with the operating system and identify which sniffer is the best for me. And also with Wireshark, you know, it's gone through its own iteration. So I, I it's taken a while, but I like it. I like failing forward. I like learning and it's been fun. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, this is this is the time for folks in the room to go ahead and uh, submit your questions. I did post a survey link and then we've got a great question from Kim Crawley. Um, are there lots of IoT devices with the Linux Bluetooth stack on it? So, I mean, the Linux Bluetooth stack, I mean, when it comes to operating system, I mean, with Raspberry Pis or Raspbian operating system, like if it's a Linux operating system already, the Bluetooth Bluesy should be there already. Yeah. Right. Um, so, You've been in you've been in this for around a year. Um, tell me what are the what are the top two or three tips that uh, Ria of today would give to Ria a year ago? Um, set up your lab at home so that you are um, your environment is accessible and you have no option but to interact with it. Also, <laughs> the Ria today knowing it's 2020 and there is COVID and this is our environment, you will have to interact with it. But also um, just go straight to Kali Linux, you know? Don't worry about setting up your virtual box um, with Ubuntu or Mint, like just go for Kali Linux. I mean, it comes with Wireshark already. It comes with a BTLE jack already. And um, yeah, just go ahead and just start early and get your hands dirty. And you know, can't really expect, I never really expected to learn and pick up anything within a week or two weeks or a month. Like I learned by failing and um, yeah, just do it and document. So three things, just go straight to Cali, set up your environment and document. So you can, um, not you, but a person, a person can get into this space uh, we're not talking about a million dollars here. We're talking about uh, a few components. You could you could set up. What would you What do you think? You could set up a lab for less than three hundred dollars if you wanted to. Yeah, like all um, all the operating systems are downloadable. You can get a Raspberry Pi like four now with amazing like RAM capabilities for like fifty bucks, or a Raspberry three for thirty five. Um, the blue fruit sniffer at Adafruit, like get the blue board, the updated one, that's like $35. And then the Uber Tooth are $35 or $40. And the Uber Tooth is like $135. And you don't need all of them. Like just choose one and and play with it. If you have an Android mobile device, there's actually a developer um, setting. Enable the Bluetooth low energy sniff capture. And there you get like two things in one. And you can basically do a data dump onto your um, onto your host and start analyzing that way, or convert it to a PCAT file and send it to Wireshark. I only discovered that I could use Microbit by accident. I actually got a Microbit board two, three years ago, and I only found out recently that I can use it as a sniffer because my Uber tooth originally wasn't working, and I started panicking. I'm like, no. So um, yeah, there are things out there that are available. If you have a mobile device that's Android, take a look at your developer settings. If you can um, spare like $35, $40, take a look at Adafruit, um, Blue Fruit Sniffer. If you want to go Uber to one and play with, you know, a great spot, like those gadgets, go ahead and like save $135. But it's, it's accessible and it works. Like Raspberry Pis are fantastic. Operating systems are free. Yeah. Okay. Can you comment at all about um, online communities or forums that folks, particularly beginners, might 
might think about using um, or just hanging out and and lurking and listening from? Any suggestions there? I would just probably go to the um, learning um, modules, not learning modules, but learning like subsites on Adafruit for one. I basically go to the documentation for like Raspberry Pi or even forums that focus on Wireshark because that's really helpful. Um, but like interactive chat rooms, I don't have a list of that yet. It's been very much a passive um, research when it comes to looking for, for um, blog posts and videos and um, free classes if you can. Okay, well, I think we just have a new addition to the list of online resources that are available to uh, new folks who are looking to get into uh, Bluetooth low energy uh, in in the this has just been a really fascinating presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, we don't have any more questions, so uh, Ria, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, this has been great, and uh, thank you to the attendees for joining us today. Uh, please remember to fill out the survey. Uh, it's it's in the it's in the stage chat and. Have a great conference, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Bye, everybody. Have a great conference.